and welcome to everybody. Welcome to our January AstroQuest. My name's Kevin Kupchinski. I run the planetarium. I do science education, mainly astronomy here at the museum. Um, joined here tonight by Mike Kerr, the director of the Science Museum, uh, Richard Sanderson, president of the Springfield Stars Club, and Caitlin Goulet, member of the Springfield Stars Club. And we've got a nice show lined up for you tonight. We're going to start out with Rich, who's got a preview of some of the events that you can see in the sky over this coming year. January is always a time to do that. Go ahead, Rich. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the Stars Club for a moment while I get your pictures ready. Okay, sure. Thank you, Kevin. And welcome, folks, to um, AstroQuest Online. Glad you made it tonight. As Kevin mentioned, the... Uh, the Springfield Stars Club is, is a local astronomy club that meets um, at the Springfield Science Museum. We have uh, monthly programs uh, on the fourth Tuesday of each month, and we also participate in uh, a museum event called Stars Over Springfield. A week from tonight will be the January Stars Club meeting, uh, January 25th at 7 p.m. The board of directors has decided to do January and February by Zoom. Um, so uh, uh, we'll be doing that as a Zoom meeting, and then in March we'll resume, if all is well with the pandemic, we'll resume uh, with our live meetings at the museum. Our January 25th program is we still have a, a waiting for a confirmation from a speaker, so we're not really sure yet what the topic is going to be, but if you'd like to get a, an email announcement, you can email me at rhs31416 at yahoo.com. And just tell me that you're interested in going to the, the January Stars Club meeting, and I'll send you, along with all the other members, a link, a, a Zoom link for that meeting, as well as the um, featured topic. And as I said, we'll be doing a Zoom in February, and then re then we'll return to the museum for live meetings. The, the Stars Club um, and, the, and the museum have joined forces for quite a few years now to conduct a public program called Stars Over Springfield on the first Friday of every month um, from, from September through May. And it's a public stargazing evening. It's held rain or shine because the museum has a, an observatory that we can either look through the telescope if it's clear or look at the telescope and learn about it if it's cloudy. And there's also um, a historic planetarium at the museum that's recently been refurbished and gotten a nice facelift. So we we usually have a program. We go to the planetarium, go up to the observatory, um, and that's at 7.30. It'll be on February 4th, Friday, February 4th, 7.30, and um, every month on the first Friday. And for the February Stars over Springfield, we have a gentleman uh, named Paul Cardoni, who's a Stars Club member, and he's going to talk about the James Webb Telescope and other recent space adventures. So. Um, you might have seen on the news of the launch of the latest uh, space telescope to join the Hubble telescope in exploring the universe. And uh, he'll um, explain what the James Webb telescope hopes to accomplish and uh, how it functions, as well as some other um, interesting satellites that are, are orbiting the Earth and doing good research. It's so what I'm going to do is a kind of a, a cosmic preview of coming attractions for 2022. Okay. While you're doing that, I might just uh, mention uh, before this started, we were chatting about how there was a really nice overpass of the of the International Space Station this evening at around 630. It went directly overhead. It was one of the brightest objects in the heavens. And the, the, the space station can be seen very easily to the naked eye. Um, and it, it can be seen quite often. Some some. Uh, overpasses are better than others you know where it goes up high in the sky and it's really bright um, there's a really good website called heavensabove.com heavensabove.com which uh, you can you can set it up for your location and it'll give you um, all the times and maps and all the um, magnitude brightnesses of different satellites including the space station you know for uh, for uh, the different overpasses from the greater Springfield area wherever you live um, you can customize it to your location. And it's, uh, you know, there's many, many satellites that you can see. The, the ISS, of course, is the most famous. 
All right, so let's um, just take a, a quick look at a, a few of the interesting objects that are coming up uh, in 2022. And there's so many different interesting objects uh, and, and events that can occur in the heavens uh, each year. And, and, you know, every year there's sort of a different mixture. You know, some years there's solar eclipses or bright comets or lunar eclipses and different things. So every year, um, is a little bit different. And that's one of the things that makes astronomy so fascinating. Some of the really great things that are in the sky. And, and, and the things I'm gonna mention now are, are events and, and um, attractions in the heavens that anybody can see, mainly with the naked eye or with binoculars. You know, you don't need a, a big expensive telescope to see it, these things. And the first um, picture I'm showing here, which is um, an example of, um, one of the, the maps that, um, that, that we can generate online um, of the nighttime sky, it shows a, a clustering of planets that's going to happen in, at the end of March. And of course, the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn um, are all visible to the naked eye, uh, mainly as, as, as bright objects. They're easily visible to the naked eye at different times and as they orbit around the sun there their positions change in the nighttime sky and um, sometimes they they happen to clump together and this this is a view uh, generated by stellarium plus which is um something that kevin uh, often uses as well to show us the nighttime sky during these programs and this is um going into the future uh, shows the sky for march 31st of this year at 5.30 a.m. So this is early morning before dawn um, on March 31st. Uh, Venus, Saturn, and Mars will be together for a while, but on this one day, they'll be closest together, as you can see um, in a little tiny triangle where all three planets will be visible in binoculars at the same time in the same field of view, which is kind of unusual. Three solar system objects clustered together in the morning sky. So. Uh, that's something to uh, look forward to. And, and we'll be mentioning these, each of these events as, as the time gets closer, but this kind of gives you an idea of what to expect and what to look forward to. Um, next, next picture, we're, we're pretty excited about uh, May of this year because there's going to be a chance to see a total lunar eclipse, which um, is all, always fun and interesting to see in the nighttime sky. And, and we get a chance to, to see a total lunar eclipse every year, every couple of years or so. Um, but this year there's two of them. So uh, we, we've got two total lunar eclipses. The first one is the best one, this one here and on the night of May 15th and 16th. Now, when you see something like that 15 and 16, that's not to tell you that it's visible on two different nights. It's the night of May 15th into the 16th. So when, it, on the evening of May 15th, when the eclipse starts, it'll be May 15th, but then midnight comes and it'll be May 16th. So it's one single night. I know there's been confusion about that where people think it's two different nights, but it's one single night. And this shows you a, a diagram created by Fred Espinak, whose nickname is Mr. Eclipse. He's an eclipse expert, creates these maps. And it shows the uh, umbra, the Earth's shadow, that red disk is the Earth's shadow, and it shows the moon passing through that shadow, which is what happens during a lunar eclipse. The, the full moon passes into the Earth's shadow. And we just had one recently that was 99% total, but this one, the moon will plunge deeper into the Earth's shadow, and, and the moon will get a very dark reddish or grayish red or orange color when it's in that shadow. Um, and it's going to be within that shadow for uh, one hour and 25 minutes. So that's a long time to see the, the moon totally eclipsed. You can see the times there. It's kind of a late night eclipse, you know, begins at 1027. Um, the moon begins to enter the dark part of the shadow. So a few minutes after that time, you'll begin to see kind of a flattening on the edge of the moon. And then, then little by little, the moon will gradually drift into the shadow of the earth. And at 1129, the shadow will completely engulf the moon. That's when total eclipse begins, 11.29 p.m. on the 15th of May. And then maximum eclipse comes right after midnight at 12.11 a.m. That's when the moon is, is deepest into the shadow and will be darkest. 
Um, and, and it gets much, much darker than a normal a full moon. The, the, the full moon is about 100,000 times brighter than a totally eclipsed full moon. So there's a huge difference in brightness. Total eclipse ends at 12:53, so the, the moon will begin coming out of the sh the, sh the dark part of the shadow, and then you'll see partial phases until 1:55 a.m. So that's a that's a, a well-timed eclipse, you know, with the the moon well above the horizon and hopefully above trees, so people can see it easily, and above the your neighbor's house and everything, you can get a good view of this event, and um, hopefully it'll be a clear night. We'll talk more about that this eclipse as as the date gets near, and we'll show you some pictures of other eclipses so you know what to expect. This this one has me really excited. You know, there's really not much scientific value to you know looking at planets lined up in the sky, but aesthetically, it, it's just a wondrous thing to see. You know, it's uplifting to see all the the planets in the solar system strung out across the sky on June 24th. And actually over a three night period, June 23rd, 24th and 25th before sunrise, there'll, there'll be a, a lineup of planets in the Eastern sky. And you can see this is again from Stellarium Plus. Not only is every solar system object that you can see with the naked eye visible here, not of course excluding the sun, but all the nighttime solar system objects are visible, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, but they're in the proper order of distance from the sun. Mercury is the closest, then Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And on June 23rd, 24th, and 25th, the moon, the thin crescent moon will be between Venus and Mars. So that becomes part of that lineup in the proper order of distance from the sun. And I, I've been trying to find out how rare that is. I can't remember ever seeing an alignment like this where they're in the, the correct order of distance. So I have a hunch it's a pretty rare event, but I, I can't tell you how rare. Mercury, of course, might be a challenge. In the lower left, Mercury is always very close to the sun. It's the innermost planet, and it'll be very close to the horizon. You might need an ocean horizon to see that. Um, it might be worth driving to the East Coast to see something like this if it's going to be a clear night. And they will be spanned out across the sky to some degree, and uh, probably you wouldn't be able to squeeze them all in, into a photograph, but still, it's, it's worth seeing. Next one. Now we have um, a couple of really good meteor showers this year in August. Every year, the Perseid meteor shower always generates some excitement. It, a, a meteor shower happens when the Earth passes through a cloud of debris, of comet debris or, or asteroid debris orbiting the sun. And these little particles collide with the Earth's atmosphere and burn up to create falling stars or meteors. And as the Earth passes through one of these swarms of litter left behind by a comet, the, the number of meteors um, increases dramatically on, on those nights. And meteor showers usually um, can last for weeks, but there's uh, always a, a peak night or a peak handful of nights. And for the Perseid shower, it's August 12th to the 13th. That's the peak night. But even the nights before and after that, you'll still see um, Perseid meteors. Um, streaking through the sky. And this is caused by debris from Comet Temple Tuttle. Um, comets are kind of like dirty snowballs orbiting the sun. And as they vaporize, they leave trails of litter. Then the Earth sweeps through it and we have a meteor shower. And, and generally, we see dozens of Perseid meteors per hour on the peak night, but the moon will interfere this year. But it's still worth watching because there's sometimes very bright meteors. And another excellent meteor shower is the Geminids, which peaks on December 13th and 14th. So there's two good meteor showers, but there's some lesser ones as well throughout the year. But the Perseids and the Geminids are the two best. And an interesting story about this photograph that I took back when I was 16 years old. This is a good example of beginner's luck. Um, I was just getting into photography of the night sky back then, and I my bedroom was on the second floor and I knew the Perseid shower was going to be that night. So I got up after midnight, which is the best time to look at a meteor shower is after midnight. And I opened my bedroom window and I set up my camera and I was taking time exposures in the northern sky, hoping to catch capture a, a meteor. And after about 15 or 20 pictures, it was like 1.30 in the morning and I, I, I clicked open the shutter and 
dozed off for about five, 10 minutes. And then I woke up and I closed the shutter. And then I said, oh, that's it. I'm going to go to bed. I'm exhausted. And I hadn't seen any meteors. But during that time I was sleeping and the camera shutter was open, open the best fireball that I ever photographed streaked across the sky. And there it is at the bottom of the picture. That bright streak of light is a bolide, an exploding meteor, very, very bright. And I captured it on film, but my eyes didn't see it because I was dozing off. And try as I might for years and years, I've tried to get another one like that. I've never managed to. So uh, that was a beginner's luck. Next picture. <clears throat> hey, Richard, if I can interrupt uh, before yeah. you move on, uh, we have a question. Why is it better to see meteors after midnight rather than before? Well, that's a that's a really good question. And I guess you have to think of it as there, there, there's a swarming trail of meteors orbiting around the sun in, in its own orbit and the earth is moving in its orbit and the earth intersects, it cuts through at, a, at an angle through the swarm of debris. So before midnight, the, the earth is turned away from that swarm. So the only meteors that would hit the atmosphere are ones that are kind of catching up with the earth because we're, we're on the trailing side of the earth. But at midnight, the earth turns to face that swarm. The earth is now facing the swarm after midnight. Where you are on the earth is facing the swarm. And so you're hitting it head on at that point. And um, you know they're hitting at a higher velocity and they're brighter and, and more numerous after midnight. So before midnight, they have to catch up with the, the atmosphere overhead. After midnight, we're plowing into it head on. The second lunar eclipse, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but this is a, a, a photo that I took of an eclipse in 1975 that's going to be sort of similar to it, where um, the, the one on November 7th to the 8th, uh, after midnight on the 8th, um, is going to happen so late at night that sunrise and twilight and sunrise is actually going to happen during totality, and it's going to kind of cut the, the eclipse short. So. We may see the partial phases. We may see the very beginning of totality, as we see in this picture here, but the total phase will be close to the horizon and the moon will actually set during totality as the sun rises. And because the moon is so dim during totality, even twilight and horizon haze will be enough to overpower it. So um, it'll be fun to look at it and see how much we can see, but but the first, the one in May will be a lot better and easier to see. This one will be a little problematic, but still worth seeing if you're hooked on eclipses like I am. The next picture, there's two more pictures to show um, Mars, the planet Mars, which is the fourth planet from the sun. And in early December, Mars is gonna be at opposition, which means the earth is directly between the sun and Mars. And when that happens, Mars is at its closest to the Earth. Sometimes Mars is on the opposite side of the sun, it's much farther away. But when they're all lined up, Mars is at its closest, its brightest, its biggest. And Mars is always a tiny planet. It's not a very big planet. It's not much bigger than the moon. So it's hard to see surface detail. But in December, it's going to look the way it did in October of 2020 when I took this picture. And Mars was a brilliant pink star-like object in the night sky. And the next picture shows what it might look like through a telescope. Um, if you have a backyard telescope in December, when Mars is at its closest, it'll be bigger. And it'll still be pretty small, but this is about the best you can see it. You might glimpse some dusky features on its surface and maybe polar ice caps. And uh, you know that's about the best you can do unless you have a large, very large uh, or observatory-sized telescope to zoom in on it. So that's a, kind of a roundup of what's happening in 2022. And um, as I said, we'll, we'll delve into each of these things in more detail as those months draw near. Okay, thanks, Rich. Um, we, we, when Rich and I were discussing this, uh, you know, the, the con what we would do ahead of time, um, and he mentioned that planetary conjunction, I thought I brought in one of my few um, astrophotography pictures. This is a planetary conjunction that happened in uh, uh, May of 2002, 2002, um, early May. 
and you and you had all of the planets. Now again, Mercury's the tough one. Mercury is just above the mouse here. And by the way, um, if you're not already doing that, um, it's really a good idea to have the lights off in your room uh, so you can see the screen. So Mercury is right up above the mouse. Um, and I'm looking at the broadcast. It's really hard. It's barely showing up. Oh, it was barely hard to see. It's just fighting the glare of the sun. So there's Mercury. There's Venus. And then uh, Saturn, Mars, and then way up here is Jupiter. And in this one, you could get them all in one shot of a camera. Uh, the one coming up in June, you would need such a wide angle that the, 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 planet, image, the planet dots will be really tiny in the image. Um, although there are other ways of doing panoramas or something like that. Uh, so anyway, that's um, reminded me of this picture, and, and so I thought I'd uh, uh, share that as well. Thanks to, and I, we've had a couple people ask questions. That's great. I forgot to remind you, yes, please go ahead and use the chat to ask questions. Uh, you can also use the Q&A. Um, hint, the chat is a little easier to find uh, when you're sharing the screen with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but uh, whichever whichever works for you, uh, we're we're glad to have you uh, post your questions as well. Okay, so like to go on and introduce Caitlin Goulet. Caitlin is a member, as I mentioned, a member of the Springfield Stars Club, and uh, Caitlin has started publishing a newsletter. Uh, which you can subscribe to with an email to starryscoop at gmail.com. Uh, when we started AstroQuest, we invited Caitlin to share a little bit out of her newsletter each month. So, Caitlin, uh, take it away. Um, so, as Kevin mentioned, I do write a monthly newsletter called the Starry Scoop. Um, I think I'm on volume 22, so this is monthly, so I'm nearing my two-year anniversary. Um, as you mentioned, you can contact me at starryscoop at gmail.com, or um, you can find me on Facebook. I have um, a Facebook page. So the Starry Scoop is comprised of several different topics. I have a WhatsApp section that um, tells about current and historical um, current events. I have a little calendar and a star map um, highlighting what's going on in the month. Um, I have an observation section, um, the retellings of my own observations and people I have interviewed. And I also have an object of the month, a fun little challenge for all the observers who read my newsletter. And this is January's edition, so the most re recent. Um, and the object of the month was the Rosette Nebula, which we will discuss um, very soon. So tonight, I will be discussing the stars of winter. This is a picture that I took um, a few years ago um, of Orion over here. We have the bull's head and the Pleiades up here, um, which I will discuss. I think like in the next slide. And the winter stars are awesome. They're one of the, some of the brightest stars of the year and they hold many hidden treasures, which we will get into. So when we think of the winter stars, we can't help think of the mighty Orion the Hunter. Um, it is a very bright constellation and can be seen in both hemispheres. It's right on the celestial equator so people all over the wor world can see it. Um, I have this wonder wonderful picture of Orion right here. We have its club, head, shoulders, belt, sword, feet, and a shield right here, Orion. And we, of course, have it right here. Now, Orion can be utilized as a guidepost in the sky. For example, you can use its three belt stars, Almatak, Almalam, and Mantaka, to point up to the star Aldebaran, the bright red eye of Taurus the bull. And along with Aldebaran, we have the Pleiades, uh, the Hyades star cluster, excuse me, um, making the um, bull's distinctive V-shaped head. And if we continue even further, we have the Pleiades open star cluster. Now, both of these open star clusters are wonderful um, with just a simple pair of binoculars, just gorgeous. Now, moving in the other direction using the three belt stars, we can go down to the bright star Sirius and the little dog or or in the big dog, excuse me, in Canis Major. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, and I will discuss it, um, I think, in the next slide. And we can also 
utilize rye gel and beetle juice and use them to point to the Gemini brothers, Castor and Pollux, to gorgeous stars. So, a lot of the stars that I've mentioned are part of the um, large asterism, the winter hexagon. The winter hexagon is great for beginner um, astronomers because it's big, it's bright, and can be used as a guide um, to help you find your way around the winter sky. So I'll go and highlight some of the stars that it's made of. We start with Rigel. Rigel is a blue-white supergiant, and it's um, made of four known stars that scientists have discovered. Now we're moving up to Aldebaran, the red eye of Taurus the Ball. Um, Aldebaran is a giant star that shines red and orange, and it has a, a diameter 35 to 40 times that of our sun. Um, next, we're moving up to Capella in Auriga. Capella is also known as the goat star, and it is the sixth brightest star in the sky. Um, and it is what we like to call a spectroscopic binary star. So it is made of multiple stars, but it requires professional equipment to just find out that they're there. Now, the two main stars that Capella is made of um, are much like our sun, but are progressing into larger red giants. So they're nearing um, the older stages of their life. Um, next, moving on to Pollux, one of the two Gemini brothers. Pollux um, has a golden glow to it, and that's um, contrasting to its brother, Castor, which shines bluish white. Now, Pollux is a single star with um, a, a known planet orbiting it, but Castor is made up of six stars, all gravitationally locked and bound together. Um, I find it amazing that the single stars that we see in our sky with our unaided eyes could have two, three, four, six or more stars. Um, the next star we're going to is Procyon in the little dog. Procyon is the eighth brightest star in the sky. Um, and now in the big dog, we have Sirius, the brightest star in our sky. Um, Sirius is known as the dog star or the rainbow star. It's known as the rainbow star because it flickers with many different colors. Now we see these flickers of colors and they're very prominent because it's low in the sky. You can always find Sirius grazing the tree line. Now, Sirius isn't the brightest star because it's so big. It's the brightest because it's very close to us. It's only eight, about eight light years away, while stars like maybe Betelgeuse or Aldebaran are hundreds times that distance. So now I'm going to tell about um, some objects that you can find in this region of the sky. Um, I'll begin with M42, or the Orion Nebula. Um, I have a picture I took of it right here a few years ago in my driveway. This is a stellar nursery where stars are born. Um, you can find this right where Orion's sword would be, so right below the belt stars. Next few objects we have are the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula. The Horsehead is a dark nebula, so it's only visible because it blocks the light coming from sources behind it. The Flame Nebula is an emission nebula, so it shines with its own light. Um, this is also a picture I, I've taken. And this um, star right here is a star, um, the first star of Orion's belt all the way to the left right here, um, Almatak. Um, the next object um, I have here is M78. Um, this wonderful photo is um, taken by Jamie Thuin. Um, it is the brightest reflection nebula in the sky. Um, and reflection nebulas, reflects the light from nearby sources, such as stars. Um, and M78 is a little bit higher up than the other ones, so it's right here on the map. We also have the Rosette Nebula. This picture was taken by Tim Conley. Um, this was the object of the month for um, the January edition of the Starry Scoop. Um, the Rosette Nebula is an emission nebula, so it shines with its own light. And the cool thing about this is it surrounds an open cluster that is embedded within the nebula. This cluster can be seen with binoculars, um, but the nebula does require a telescope under dark skies to see it. Um, and you can find the Rosette Nebula around right here off of Betelgeuse. The final object I have for tonight is M1, the Crab Nebula. It is a supernova remnant. Um, its story begins in 1054, when it first appeared as a guest star in our sky. Um, observers um, could see it with their unended eye in the daytime sky for several days, and in the nighttime sky for even longer than that. Um, it eventually faded from our view. Um, and then today, we found the Crab Nebula. 
and we connected this crab nebula to the recordings of the guest star in our sky. And today we know that it's a supernova remnant of an exploding star, um, and it's an ex ever expanding gas cloud. Um, and we can find this right off of a horn star in Taurus, the ball up here. Um, I would like to thank you all for watching. Clear skies, and remember to keep looking up. Thank you, uh, thank you, Caitlin. And um, we'll go ahead and yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and start taking a look at some of the uh, some of the events, uh, some of the things, and and uh, our focus tonight is going to be on uh, zodiac constellations and one of the lesser known ones or one of the dimmer ones anyway which is cancer so here we are we're looking at the program stellarium as uh, rich mentioned this is available for um, basically any computer and um, rich by the way were you looking at that on your ipad uh, Stellarium Plus? Yeah, yeah, those were um, screen saves that I made on my iPad. Yeah, so the Plus version is, is uh, iPad. You can get it on tablets. You can get it on any uh, any any computer as well. Uh, it's it's great to look at to see what can I see tonight, and also uh, look for some of those events as you know Rich showed you right screenshots from this to see uh, what's going on track the moon and see when the moon's going to be near something interesting, one of the stars or, or one of the constellations or so on. So we're looking at uh, 6 o'clock tonight, which is, oh, it's about an hour and 10 minutes or an, almost an hour, 15 minutes after sunset. So it gets, it's pretty dark by then. And I, as we mentioned last month, pretty much the only planet now that we have is Jupiter. The big planet show that we had uh, well, yeah, that's that's going to be over for a while. It'll come back at us at, by the end of the year uh, with Mars uh, in the in the picture as well, uh, really nice and bright at opposition. So you can still go out to the west. You can still see Jupiter on there uh, low in the sky. One other thing, uh, one thing again that you can do with Stellarium is, is you kind of look look through and look around and, and and see what events that you might find. And one that I noticed is going to be on the 29th of this month. Um, it's not quite as cool as the conjunction that Rich showed us, but it still it still might be kind of fun to look for. However, we it's it's in the morning and we have we can see just coming up, maybe we'll advance the time a little bit more. We have Venus, Mars, and the moon. The nice crescent moon. And it's the crescent moon is kind of cool to get next to something. Um, if if you can, it's great to scan it with binoculars while you're looking at the other at the other things up there. You probably need um, binoculars from Mars. It's it's uh, not at opposition right now. It's still kind of dim. And Venus, no problem. You'll see that pretty well. And basically, you are just sort of racing. I went ahead an hour. You are kind of just racing as the time goes on. The sun's coming up, and that's going to dim out Mars. But that, and it's not awfully early in the morning um, by then. So if you've got a good eastern, a uh, low eastern horizon, um, that could be that could be something to check out. Let's go in now a couple more days into February, and we have kind of a uh, a marker event. And as we look to the east, early next. Uh, Early next month, even this month, I mean, even this month, there's Orion in the eastern sky. So maybe just very quickly uh, zoom out a little bit. And here's basically what Caitlin was showing you. You look to the, what is that, southeast. There's um, Sirius, very bright, very low in the sky. Orion, Taurus, um, Auriga, uh, or Capella the star. Gemini and Procyon down there. This is the winter uh, winter hexagon, I believe they call it. Winter circle too, for I guess you could call it um, for that matter as well. 
So you'll have that. But then on the second, down toward the east, let's see if we can pick up this one star. Yeah, that one star is in the constellation Leo. And at so on February 2nd, Leo is just coming into the sky at the onset of darkness. Maybe if we, um, let's proceed a little further into the evening and get a little more of that to show up. Leo's main sort of feature is sort of a semi, a semi circle, looks like a backwards question mark. And well, what's, what's the thing here? Well, the 2nd of February, we do something to think about how long is it going to be, right, until winter is over. And on the 2nd of February, winter is about half over. Uh, folks would or, um, note that by noticing that Leo was just coming into the sky um, just as it was getting dark in the early evening. And uh, one of the traditional names for the February 2nd was a holiday called Candlemas. And uh, they had a phrase, um, half your grain and half your hay you should have on Candlemas Day, because that was the halfway time. And of course, we do something, yep, thanks, Mike. We do something uh, on, on that day. Um, we do that with a groundhog. Somehow, I think maybe we should be calling it Lion's Day instead of Groundhog's Day, because the lion's up there telling us that uh, basically winter's halfway over. I think we know what goes on with the groundhog, right? If, uh, what is it, if the groundhog sees its shadow, if, if the groundhog doesn't see its shadow, it stays out, um, it'll be spring in six weeks, but if it does see the shadow, it runs back in, and it won't be spring for a month and a half. Anyway, that there we go. There, so there again, a little bit of a milepost, I guess, as we can say, um, as we as we approach as we approach that. And again, uh, if you can get Stellarium, you can kind of poke around and see when the moon will be next to things and so on. Well, I'd like so let's go ahead and get back to the western sky here. It's, no, I I beg your pardon. We need to be in the eastern sky still. And there's Leo, there's, um, there's Gemini. We do need to get back to tonight's sky, though. Okay, so there we are, and we have the moon in the picture. And we have, there's, there's Gemini. Leo is down below the horizon at this point, and the moon is about halfway in between. Now, if we zoom in on the moon, we see that the moon is right next to this little bunch of four stars, and a whole bunch of little, a whole bunch of stars in the middle. This is the central portion of the constellation Cancer. So right now we could say the moon is in Cancer, and that bunch of stars in the middle, it now goes by the name of the Beehive Cluster. Uh, this is uh, quite a collection of stars. There's uh, at least a thousand stars in that cluster. It's an open cluster, very much like the Hyades and the Pleiades that um, Caitlin showed you. Uh, open cluster is a bunch of stars that all form together in the same dust cloud, and they're gravitationally bound together, and they're moving through space with each other. Eventually, they, they, the gravitational attraction weakens and they all go their separate ways, but right now, they're, um, they're all together. This cluster is, it, it's one of the closest open clusters to us. It's, uh, the estimates are somewhere between 500 and 600 light years. Uh, and again, as, as uh, Mike mentioned in the chat, a light year is basically how far light travels in one year. Turns out to be a very handy measurement of distance in astronomy. This is also uh, the first cluster where planets have been found. There are now known to be six planets at stars within that cluster. Uh, and the first of those planets that was discovered were the first planets ever found in any star cluster. Uh, imagine what, if you're in the middle of a thousand stars, what your night sky might look like. Um, it may be hard to do astronomy uh, from a planet like that. The, the, so the moon's right near there. The, the 
more traditional name for this cluster going back a, a lot further to the Romans is a precipice, which is the manger. And the two bright stars down at, at, on this side are two donkeys, the northern donkey and the southern donkey who are feeding at the manger. Uh, they sort of have a place of honor. Uh, these donkeys were ridden into battle. The, the uh, characters who rode them, Dionysus and Silenus, and this was in the battle against the Titans. Apparently, Titans didn't know what donkeys were, and the noise that the donkeys made was uh, scared them somewhat and helped the battle in favor, so they've got their place of honor in the sky and plenty to eat in the manger there. It, interestingly enough, this constellation really has been known as either a crab or at least some kind of a water creature going way, way back, way before the Greeks, um, to the ancient Sumerians. And uh, through the period of the Babylonians, and then as the Babylonian civilization was waning, the, uh, the, the Greek civilization uh, was flourishing. And the Greeks just really took a lot of stuff from uh, the Babylonians, including this. Um, include, and, the, and the Babylonians took a lot of their stuff from the Sumerians um, before them. Uh, so this, this character, this really goes back many thousands of years as either a crab, maybe a tortoise, or, or at least some kind of a water creature. And then interestingly enough, come on over here to our continent and the Mayans a little bit after um, that time, the Mayans might have seen this as a frog. Uh, definitely, it, it, it seems to have that water thing for a lot of people. Uh, in the southwest of uh, our continent, uh, the people of the Pueblo have a story about a great leader named, named Longsash. And Longsash led them from wherever they used to be to uh, the place where, where they made the Pueblos. And during that journey, it was a long journey, and at one point in that journey, Longsash felt he was losing his way, and it came to the place of doubt. Um, cancer in that, in that story is associated with that, with that place of doubt. Now, the thing is, though, okay, fine, I had to zoom way in so we can see it. Granted, the moon is there, and the moon is going to make things hard to see, but as you as you might know or probably know cancer is one of the zodiac constellations but it is when if we zoom back out you know compared to uh gemini or up to taurus okay and then to come will be leo it it's not much to look at uh, uh, granted back in the day those folks had darker skies maybe they saw it but it still was a lot dimmer so how in the world does that get to be a zodiac constellation being so dim? Well, it turns out that uh, this is really more about location, location, location. There's the sun. And then we can do something in Stellarium. We can, you know, the daytime, you can't see the stars, but you can take care of that in Stellarium with the press of a button. Uh, so what if the atmosphere didn't disperse the light and, and, and you, we could see outer space during the day? What would we see? We, we would see the sun by the 30th. So on the 18th, it's sort of just leaving by the 30th. The sun is right there in the middle of those four stars. There's the two donkeys. Every time during the year, the sun is near or in, that's what we call the sun being in the constellation Cancer, for example. So the sun is in that constellation. And okay, so fine, as I, you know, as I said, people were noticing this thousands of years ago. They didn't have Stellarium, right? How the heck did they know that? You know, how would they, how could, how could they tell? Right. And basically by a lot of observation. Um, now, let's do this. Let's go to about four in the morning. In other words, it's more or less sunrise. And at 4.30 in the morning, um, Gemini is just rising. Let's put the atmosphere back. OK. And we can see that at 4.30 in the morning, it's starting to get light. You can see Gemini because they're bright stars and Venus as well and Orion. 
but it's Gemini that we're interested in here. You can see it coming up, and as if we as we progress any more, if the sun is going to come up, it's going to blot out everything. So Gemini is the last major constellation that you see coming up before it gets too bright to see the stars. And this is called a heliacal rising. And this is something that the folks could see thousands of years ago. And then, because they're observers of the sky, so they would see this coming up about 4.30, just as getting bright, and about two hours later, there's the sun. Well, from other times of the year, when it's not coming up with the sun, like, for example, tonight, they would know that after Gemini comes up, about two hours later, is Cancer. So even though you can't see the stars there, because you saw Gemini on the horizon two hours ago with a heliacal rising, you know that the sun was in Cancer. And so this, um, this idea of the sun being in a constellation was a really, really big deal um, to people because they were using this to track the seasons. This was very, very important. They did not have calendars that were really able to track the seasons very reliably the way ours does. We just know. We want to know where are we in relation to the seasons. Just look at a calendar, right? And where are you in relation to December 21st or June 21st or March, right? And right away, you know where you are with, in relation to the changing of the seasons. Not so back then. But people noticed that these, with these observations, they noticed that the changing of the seasons matched these sun positions very, 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 very well. Now, let's move to the, let's wrap it up here. We're going to move to the uh, summer solstice. So somewhere around the, uh, so the 21st, and maybe just pop it up one more hour so the sun's a little easier to see and we're going to get rid of the horizon again. I mean, get rid of the atmosphere again. And so now on the, on the summer solstice, there is, um, there is Taurus and boy, too bad we can't see, um, during the day. Wow. Look at the Mercury's going to be right there. Um, but no luck. It's really going to be light out. Uh, and, so, the, and there's Gemini, and the sun is sort of in between. The sun is sort of leaving Gemini, getting into Taurus. Okay, so what we have to do to really understand the significance of Cancer is go back to the time of the Babylonians. Now, at the year minus 1,000, a 1,000 years before zero, 1,000 years about the dawning of the Greek civilization, height of the Babylonian civilization, and there's Leo, there's Gemini, there's Cancer, and we can see the sun is more or less leaving Gemini, getting into, um, getting into Cancer at, a, at the time of the summer solstice. And that was the solstices and the equinoxes, those were the four times of years that they keyed in on. So Cancer was a really, really big deal at that time. Uh, and, and that was the time it, at the dawning of the Greek civilization and toward the end of the Babylonian. That's where they got into some of this idea of, you know, tracking the stars to see, uh, you know, events in your life and so on. Um, things that we know today as horoscopes were being developed right around that time. This all together was a, a, a really, really big deal, and it earned cancer a place. In, in the zodiac, because it marked, especially because it marked at that point, it marked the summer solstice um, for, for those people uh, back when they were really making a lot of and, and recording a lot of observations. And, you know, today it, it, things have changed a little bit. The sun is not at that constellation anymore, but uh, it, it still keeps its place in the zodiac because of that. So I think that's gonna that should wrap us up for um, tonight. Um, I don't see I, I don't think I see anything else in the chat, Mike. Um, do you, uh, is there is there do you, are you seeing anything else?
If not, we we'll thank everybody for uh, for coming by tonight. So you might be able to go out and take a peek at the moon. Now, because it's so bright, you may not um, be able to see the beehive cluster, uh, maybe unless you have binoculars or if you're in a really dark sky. But you'd be, maybe get out and take a peek real fast. So thank you very much for uh, coming by tonight. Uh, our next Astro Quest is going to be on the 15th of February. Uh, hope to see you then in maybe warmer times, slightly warmer anyway, as, as we begin to uh, leave winter behind us. So everybody have a great night. Thank you for coming in, and we hope to see you again next month.